Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and misses English class. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and Summer of Stolen Secrets. And I'm Eve Yohalem. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related topic. And in this episode, we consider what's it like to see the world through the eyes of a visual artist who illustrates and writes books. I have been a fan of Marla Frazee's work ever since I read the Clementine chapter book series. It's written by Sarah Pennypacker and illustrated by Marla. And I challenge you to find more charming and evocative illustrations that just bring a book to life. They are perfect. I would be a happier person if I just put Marla's images of Clementine up all over my walls. I was so excited to see that she has a new picture book out called The Farmer and the Circus, which is the third in her Farmer Books trilogy. We asked if she'd come on the podcast to talk about that book and her whole career, and I'm just thrilled that she said yes. It was fascinating to hear her stories and perspectives. She's just incredible, and I really can't adequately express how much I adore the Farmer Books. It's so interesting. You and I read a ton of children's books and we talk about them all the time. But talking to Marla, it's clear that because she's a visual artist, she sees them in a very different way than we do. Yes. And I love the way that she conveys that in our conversation. It's just so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So let's tell you a little more about Marla Frazee. She was awarded a Caldecott honor for all the world and another one for a couple of boys have the best week ever and the Boston Globe Horn Book Award for The Farmer and the Clown. She's the author illustrator of Roller Coaster, Walk On, Santa Claus, the world's number one toy expert, The Boss Baby and Boot and Shoe, as well as the illustrator of many other books, including The Seven Silly Eaters, Stars, the New York Times bestselling Clementine series and God Got a Dog. Her picture book, The Boss Baby, was the inspiration for the DreamWorks movie by the same name, which features Alec Baldwin as the voice of the boss baby and was number one at the box office for a bunch of weeks. The sequel to that movie just came out. Before we dive into our conversation with Marla, I want to give a tiny bit of background about a book that she discussed in detail with us. She says it was really formative for her. It's called The Carrot Seed, and it was written in 1945 by Ruth Krauss. It was always one of my favorites. It's about a boy who plants a carrot seed. His mother and his father and his big brother all say the seed won't come up, but the boy waters it and tends to it every day until one day it does come up just like he knew it would. That's all you need to know. Marla's going to say more. Okay. We started by asking Marla to tell us the story of how she became a children's book illustrator. Here's what she said. It's a story that goes back to almost before I have have language. From the time I was pretty little, I knew that I wanted to become a children's book writer and illustrator, which is very strange because I never met somebody who did it. But I just loved the books that I loved. And I just somehow knew that I wanted to grow up and do that. The first book I loved was called The Carrot Seed. Oh, I love that book. Me too. Oh, my God. I was really lucky. My mom had been an elementary school teacher before she had kids. And so she had a lot of her teaching supplies at home and she'd use them with us. One of the books she had was The Carrot Seed. And so that was the first book that I fell in love with. And then soon after, Blueberries for Sal, a book that I also fell in love with. And then The third was Where the Wild Things Are. And those three books just clinched the deal for me. I wanted to grow up and learn how to do that. And can you tell us what was it specifically about the three books that spoke to you? Oh, I sure can. When I was really young, I think what was so subversive about the carrot seed to me was that the mom and dad and the big brother didn't know what they were talking about. Like that was just what? Mm -hmm. I just couldn't wrap my mind around. I remember just being shocked. They didn't know they were wrong. So that was shocking news. And also just the fact that the carrot was so big and so exuberant and such a surprise. It only like reinforced that point that not only were they wrong, that, you know, the seed wouldn't grow to be a carrot, but really wrong, which was funny. Mm -hmm. Later, I realized how spare it was in both words and pictures and how 
its appearance is that it's a very simple story, but it's just so resonant. It's so complex. And it's really about so many things that are so important, like hope and faith in yourself and all kinds of things. Is my memory correct that it's just line drawings in that book or maybe a little bit of color? But it's- yes, there's maybe one or two colors. It was, you know, um, Crockett Johnson was a cartoonist. And so it has a very simple line. Also, the character is drawn in, in a very similar way on most of the pages. You know, there isn't that much change in, in his position, his expression, which is also interesting because it never is boring. It's, you know, I certainly didn't know any of this when I was really little and loved it. But, you know, it really does sort of reinforce that it's about waiting. It's about time passing because it just it doesn't change, you know. The character is just very steadfast in his knowledge that this is going to work. This seed is going to grow. I had never put that together before. I (laughs) love that book and Mm -hmm. I had never put that together. And I had never thought about the size of the carrot. It's so interesting that even as a kid, you loved that, the impact of that visual image. I never thought about that. Yeah, I mean, because carrots are... You know, they're just these scrawny little vegetables. But yet that one was just this heroic carrot, you know. And I don't mean to psychoanalyze you, but you've just (laughs) told us, but I will, but you've just told us that you knew almost before you had language that you wanted to be a children's book illustrator. And what you're describing about the carrot seed is this steadfast belief in a very small child in a very big idea. Mm. Hmm. Dr. So, e. Yeah, the doctor is in. <laughs> That'll be 25 cents, please. <laughs> Another major influence, Charles Schultz, of course. Exactly. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so that that was definitely like the thing about the carrot seed. But Blueberries for Sal was a book that I fell in love with the character of Sal. I wanted her to be my friend. I wanted to have her overalls in fact I'm wearing some right now Mm. um I wanted to wear this kind of shoe she wore I wanted my hair to look like her I loved that her overall strap kept falling off her shoulder I thought that was so cute (laughs) and I actually feel like I took it even further and I wished I were her and later as I thought about that book as I grew older and thought about why was that I found out that Robert McCloskey modeled that character after his own daughter, Sal. She was a real kid and he loved her. Of course, it's his daughter. And I think a lot of that book was definitely autobiographical, which you can kind of see it's the details of it. Mm -hmm. And even on, on the end papers where you're in the kitchen, you open it up and you're right there in the kitchen with little Sal and her mother and they're canning the blueberries it's an interesting piece that you see right away because it's before they even go pick them when you see it. And then it's on the back and papers as well. So it kind of bookends the story of getting the blueberries and the adventure of it and the drama of it. Mm-hmm. But you're just right in the story. And I love how little Sal is putting like the little canning rings on her wrist. You know, she's very engaged in this odd little project of, you know, has nothing to do with actually canning. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. And and then the kitchen is just full of the things that are in a real kitchen that you would actually be in. And it looks kind of like the 20s and maybe 30s, which is not when the book is set. It's set more when it was published decades later. So it makes me think that that was Robert McCloskey's childhood kitchen which would also make sense mm-hmm. as an author and illustrator of a book. And it's about his own child and it's probably about his own childhood and just taking the details of your life and the ones that really resonate with you and mean something to you and putting them into the details of the story that you're writing is something that I think that book really taught me the importance of that, because I remember the feeling of it, even though as a, we don't always know that we're looking at something that meant something to the author or the illustrator specifically, we kind of feel the emotion of it. I sensed it was real, that she was real and that that world that he was creating was 
was real. Yeah. And then, of course, Wild Thing is not real. Right. But it's, you know, influenced by real emotions. And I think that book was, it's definitely an emotional book. It's about the emotion, the emotional landscape of the buildup of anger, really, and, and then the release of it. And he uses every aspect of the form of a picture book to communicate that. I mean, there's so many things we could talk about with regard to where the wild things are, but one of them is just the layout on the page and how the pictures start kind of small and contained with a lot of white space, and then they get larger, and then they get larger, and then they start bleeding up to the edge of the paper, and then they spill over the gutter, and then to the point where, you know, it's full double page spreads, full bleed, three wordless spreads where you're just engulfed in this... um, you know, the wild rumpus. And then it starts to collapse down to his very own room on page, let's say 31, which is a right hand page full bleed. And then you turn the page and it's all the way to white, you know, no image. And it's just, and it was still hot, which is sort of like the Looney Tunes. I think it's the Looney Tunes cartoons that kind of they would get reduced to that little dot at the end yeah. and it was over <laughs> and it just sort of like, it's done. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first saw it, I was sitting at the public library in my, the town in which I grew up and I was a reader at that point, but I would pull the picture books off the shelf and just sit on the floor with them. And that's when I first saw where the wild things are. And I pulled it off and I sat there reading it on the floor And when Max's room turned into a forest in three page turns, Mm -hmm. I grew up in Southern California and I spent time at Disneyland. And in those years we had these, it was like A through E tickets, depending on which ride you wanted to go on. So the really spectacular rides were E tickets and you had to save them because you had this ticket book and there were only a few of those E ticket rides you had in the book to go on. And so an e-ticket ride was like, you know, just a magnificent experience. And I felt like I had just been on an e-ticket ride, sitting on the floor, like, what happened? How did he do that? And I went backwards and I turned the the pages and it went back into a bedroom. And it's like, I turned it forward again. It's like, oh my God, a forest and then back and back. And how did he do that? How did he do that? And I just wanted to learn how to grow up and do something that magical with page turns. And so that book kind of allowed me to see that there was a form that was being played with. Mm. And also, okay, so another one, I'm going back to Blueberries for Sale. I was stunned by like the decision that McCloskey made to have that book printed in blueberry blue ink as opposed to black. And I felt like that was a present he was giving me, me, like what a gift. I also thought that with where the wild things are, when I realized how much time Sendak would have put into those pictures with all those little ink lines. When I'm working, I I think about that when things take me a long time, it's worth it. Mm, That's really beautiful. I love that. My mind is blown right now. I loved those three books as a kid too. I love them as an adult, but I'm not a visual thinker and I miss so much. It was fascinating to hear Marla talk about the similarity of the art on each page of the carrot seed and how that reinforces the idea of the boy's, of the boy's steadfast faith and about Sendax exploding the page and the wild things and her focus on the tiny details like the overall strap that keeps falling off in Blueberries for Sal. Yeah, I adored those books too and never noticed any of those details, at least not consciously. But we must have taken them in unconsciously, right? Which must be part of why those books are still favorites for practically everybody on the planet. The marriage of words and pictures kind of bypasses your brain and goes straight to your heart. Sorry, Mm. that was a disaster of a metaphor, (laughs) but you know what I mean. (laughs) 
I do. And I feel so fortunate that they never bypassed Marla's brain. We asked her next how she's able to create whole worlds from picture book texts, which have so few words. Here's what she said. Yeah, I love this question because um, that is what my job is. And also with a picture book, the whole point is to have both, you know, the words and the pictures to add up to something bigger than each of them are on their own. If I'm the illustrator, I'm, I have a completed edited text in front of me. Who knows how long the author has been working on that text and revising that text. And my job is to kind of come in and add a whole other thing that's going to seem as if it's all always been there. And I remember in the first book I ever did, I, I realized I was so new and didn't really understand a lot of how to do any of this. One of the things I had to do was just sort of figure out the specifics of the pictures and how to make them make sense with the words. And, and there was this point in the story where I just couldn't understand like why the words were written the way they were at the end. You know, it was like the big ending and it's, how am I supposed to do this? And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And when it unlocked for me, it was like, oh, whoa, I could do that. And then what I have to do to do that, I'll have to start at page one and thread it all the way through. And it totally clicked into place. And it was just like, so exciting. It was the moment in which I wasn't the illustrator just the illustrator anymore. It wasn't just a wrist that was sort of decorating this text. I was providing a picture story that was going to make the whole thing make sense visually. The ownership I felt over the book then too. It's like I'm I'm a co-writer here. This is a storytelling exercise. And I was so excited. And then from that point on I always looked for those opportunities in the manuscripts I was illustrating, if it didn't provide those to me, I, I wasn't interested in illustrating the book. Sometimes I, I think the author doesn't even know that they're there. They're working with words and like the rhythm of those words and perfect words in perfect places, but they might not understand when something is becomes visual that those spaces really exist. Mm. Can you give us an example of a time when you've taken a text and added elements that aren't anywhere on the page? I can. The Seven Silly Eaters, which was written by Marianne Hoberman. It was the third book I'd illustrated, and it's just a genius manuscript. And so my editor at the time, Linda Zuckerman, she, she said to me, here's this manuscript and you're there's no way you should illustrate this with human characters because I just don't think it would work like so think about alligators or zoo birds I remember her saying this and I had this manuscript about this mother who had seven children and she was trying to provide them each with a different food that they loved and so she was more and more and more of a wreck as the story went on and, you know, one would question, like, why is she doing this? Why is she trying to meet all these children's bizarre demands? You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, what's going on here? But I knew there's no way this is about animals or zoo birds. This is about a mother, any mother who's stretched too thin. And it was really about me. Like, at the time, I had three little boys. My youngest was still an infant when I got this manuscript. I knew like, this is my story. This emotionally is what I struggle with every day. Yeah. So I knew I had to sell my editor on the idea that this isn't going to be about animals and make it work for her to kind of buy into it because she really felt strongly it should be animals. And then a huge piece of the manuscript to answer your question that wasn't there is that there was no mention of Mr. Peters in the entire word story. Mm. Never mentioned. Yet, <laughs> here's this mom who has a baby every time you turn the page for the first half <laughs> of the book. I mean, so you got to put a man in there somewhere. Like, I mean, it was just, yeah. so, so Mr. <laughs> Peters had to be there. I wanted to, to have him be a character in the story. Mm -hmm. He's only in the pictures. 
I also wanted Mrs. Peters to kind of have something besides just being a mom who keeps having kids. And so on page one, I have her playing a cello. And it's an instrument I've always wished I played. And also, it's a very maternal-ish instrument to me in terms of the way you, you hold it. And you know, here's this mother who's nurturing all these kids. And it just felt like you could almost have to cradle it. And then she has to set it aside because she just has too many demands on her time. And so having that cello sort of off to the side. And then at the end, when things kind of work out and the whole family is cooperating together, she's able to pick it up again. Mm. That was a story that went through the, the book that wasn't in the text at all, the husband or the cello. And then with All the World, All the World was written by Liz Garten Scanlon. And it's such an incredible text as well. And the people in reviews have said, Liz Garten Scanlon wrote All the World about a seaside community, which has all these, you know, families and friends. And she didn't actually, it was, um, a poem about it's an amazing, beautiful, incredible poem, but all those connections are in the pictures and the setting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love that that is the experience a reader would have when they're reading the book. They can't really separate it out. Yeah. And that's my goal, actually. I went back and took a look at All the World, which is one of Marlowe's two Caldecott honor books. It really is a remarkable, vivid example of taking just a few words and creating a lush, beautiful, like fully realized world that I just want to step into and never leave. Marla is so talented, and I love that she knew forever that she wanted to be a children's book illustrator and that she made it happen. It's like she saw a space for herself in the world that she needed to fill, almost in the same way that she finds spaces in the manuscripts of the stories she illustrates. Hmm. I like um, that. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so Marla has illustrated not just picture books for very young kids, but also chapter books like the Clementine series. We asked her what's different about illustrating books for that older audience, and here's what she said. So... When Sarah's manuscript came up to my attention, I was just, you know, yes, I want to do this book. It's different because in a book like that, the assumption is that a child could potentially read it themselves. Um, they're beginning to read. And I felt like I was providing hand and foothold, almost like a climbing wall for a child to kind of grasp onto after maybe getting through a chunk of text. And I remember that feeling of being an, a new reader. You kind of like look to see where the next illustration is, like how far do I have to go to get to the next picture? And if it was like, let's say two page turns full of text without an illustration, it's like a little bit of a panic. Mm -hmm. Am I going to make it? Yeah. <laughs> Am I going to get that far? And, and so that's sort of what I was aware of. I really didn't want to have more than two page turns of just text. I wanted to kind of keep those hand and footholds coming so that there wasn't too far to go. Mm -hmm. I also always needed to have like the illustration on the page in which that text was. I hated as a kid having to find the illustration like on a different page. Oh, really yeah. bad to me. What was up with that? Like, why, why would they do that? Yeah, especially the 19th century <laughs> books, like the, the Louisa May Alcott or the, yeah. they'd be like 100 pages off. I know, you pages. had to go find it. It was so irritating. It's already yeah. hard enough to read it. But, you know, it, it still would happen. Like by the time we got to a printed galley or something, just because of the way the text would change, or if there was an edit that was made that added a sentence at the last minute, it would maybe push the illustrations off into a different page. And it would be like, oh, no, 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 we have to bring it back to this page. Yeah. Do you think it's weird that authors and illustrators rarely communicate and instead work with a common editor? Are there times when you'd rather work directly with an author? <laughs> um, I don't think it's weird. 
there was a story that I did not do a long time ago. There was, it was a story that had to do with a family and a dog and a house. And it came with the photographs of the family and the dog in the house, mm-hmm. but it wasn't nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, it was kind of like, well, yes, but I've had my dogs that I've loved and I have my family in those relationships and I've lived in houses. And if I'm going to really do a deep dive into what those things feel like to me, I'm probably going to pull those feelings out of my own life. I don't have any attachment to these photographs or these details. I didn't live that life. So I think there's that space is really necessary. We haven't talked about The Farmer in the Circus, which is your new book. Tell us about The Farmer in the Circus and the trilogy that it's part of. What inspired the trilogy? Did you think about using words? Can you tell us about the process of working on it? Sure. I mean, when I did The Farmer and the Clown, the first book, it was published in 2014. I never thought of it as part of a trilogy. It was a singular book. It was just that book. And one of the things that happened with that book is when it was already out and I was signing it at Book Expo, this woman came up to the signing table and put it down and she had tears in her eyes and she said, this book saved me. And I'm like, really? Yeah. And she said, um, everybody falls off their train at some point or another. And I fell off mine, just like this little clown did in the book. And I went through a divorce last year and this book saved me. And I kind of just stared at her and I thought, oh, my God, I went through a divorce while I was making it. I never thought of it that way while wow. I was making it. I mean, it was yeah. so crazy because I feel like it did the same thing for me as I made it because throughout the whole process I would come home at the end of those days those long days and I would sort of do the work and calm down and so this is like a little bit later and she said this and it's just in my mind like how amazing it is that our work can sort of help us through things that we don't even know the relationship the story is really actually having to whatever the transition might be in our lives. Yeah. Um, And then fast forward like four years and I was in a breakup of another relationship and I had really, really bad insomnia. I could not sleep. I felt like I was losing my mind. And I remembered this sort of landscape and the soothing quality of being in the book of the farmer and the clown. And so instead of lying there thinking about my life, I just returned to like the world of that book. And I would ask myself in the middle of the night, like what happened to that little clown? And what happened when the farmer saw that there was a monkey following him back home? And, and I started to answer these questions like, oh, that happened. Oh, and then that happened. And suddenly I had a larger story. Amazing. Yeah, I, I had no idea that it, that was what was going to happen. I didn't intend for the first book when I had the initial idea that it was going to be a wordless book. But once I started sketching it out, I realized it was about, you know, these two characters who look one way on the outside and are actually a different way on the inside. And I thought that that needed to be shown as opposed to, you know, I wanted the reader to sort of see that as opposed to have me tell that story with words. I mean, I had been tossing around ideas in my mind about clown book, which is weird. But um, when I saw like the tall farmer, I kind of had this image of the tall farmer, grumpy, holding the hand of this smiling baby clown. And it was like, those are my characters. Why are they together? And that's sort of what started the whole thing. And then as I was drawing the the initial sketches, it was like, oh, yeah, I guess this is going to be wordless. I think that's the way to tell it. Okay, just a really quick plot summary of the farmer books so you'll know what they're about. 
Over the course of these three books, a baby clown is separated from his family when he accidentally bounces off their circus train and lands in a lonely farmer's field. Eventually, spoiler alert, the train comes back, the clown is reunited with his family, and the farmer is going to be alone again. But then a playful circus monkey follows the farmer home and spends some time with him there. Ultimately, the farmer goes to visit the circus and everyone spends time together. Trust me, I am not doing these books justice. <laughs> There's so much more than that plot summary. I have such a vivid memory of reading the farmer books for the very first time. I texted you as soon as I was done and I said, just finish the farmer books. There are some parts you're going to have to explain to me, which makes me love them. Do you remember that? I do remember that. Yeah. I had so many questions. And then I reread them really slowly, just studying the images and the faces and the body language of the characters, kind of like how small children will study the pictures in a picture book, kind of half listening to their grown up while the grown up reads the text. And then the, the kid comes up with some incredible observation because they're looking so carefully. It was only when I slowed down that I understood the emotions, the depths of the emotions of the characters. I was so moved. Yes, I agree. Reading them is one of those rare, deeply rewarding experiences when you gain more and more, the more often that you return to the books. And wasn't that a crazy story about the woman reader who told Marla, this book really helped me through a divorce, that she had fallen off a train for a bit and had to find her way. And then Marla realized that she was going through a divorce as she was creating the books. She herself was falling off a train and seeking help. Like she hadn't even realized that connection. I know that that was amazing. Yeah. I always love stories like that of our subconscious sort of sneakily hijacking the creative process. Sometimes I think we realize it along the way. Oh, I guess that's what's nagging at me. That's what I'm trying to figure out here. And sometimes it's something a reader says and we're like, right, I see it now. And sometimes we don't ever figure it out. We don't right. ever find out. <laughs> there is that third option. You know, yeah. I suspect visual artists are always working on that subconscious level maybe working to that subconscious level or both, something, okay. now, something in there. Now, no, now I'm just going to start pretending to understand the subconscious and I, I truly don't. So that is it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find Marla at www.marlafrazy.com and on Twitter at Marla Frazy. Many thanks to our producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eviohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julie and